OK, uh, welcome all. According to my clock, that's uh, 12.30, um, so we're going to start. The webinar's going to run until probably, or finish probably at 2 o'clock, if not soon, but um, slightly before. Uh, this is the first of our mid-tier, consumer stewardship mid-tier webinars that we're running specifically for land agents. It's very much focused on mid-tier uh, rather than higher tier. Uh, it's very much an overview of the scheme, focusing on some of the improvements we made since last, since last year and the application process. Um, my name's Alex Adam. I'm from Natural England. I'm leading on communications around countryside stewardship. There's a range of other people on the call today. Uh, we've got Rebecca Ashford, who's very kindly doing some of the uh, technical detail in terms of running the webinar. Martin Froman's with us at the moment to deal with some of the uh, uh, scheme-specific uh, queries, although Martin does need to leave us at one. We've got James Phillips to cover the wildlife pollinator bird package, uh, Philippa Mansfield to cover the watery stuff, and, and Graham, um, uh, who's um, dealing with our kind of FAF events, is also on hand to answer any questions. If we can't deal with any questions on this call, uh, we will try and pick them up and respond to people. Um, but with that, and just before we go on to uh, the, the content of the, the webinar, I just want to touch on or repeat some of the messages around housekeeping. This is a new service that we're using. We changed supplier last uh, end of last week, uh, so we are sort of slightly learning as we go. If anyone has any questions, please submit them via the chat functionality. You can access chat by clicking on the blue speech bubble or the speech bubble in the top right-hand corner uh, of your screen. That means you can submit a question. When submitting a question, please send it to everyone. That means that everyone who's dialed into this call can see those questions and also see the answers, um, and it helps everyone learn um, and get information around the scheme. So uh, without further ado, let's crack on. Um, the rough agenda for today, I should say for many people I know who've already joined um, earlier webinars, this is reflects, very much reflects the agenda and the content that we're giving at the countryside stewardship events that we're running, well, as of, I think, from tail end of this week throughout the summer. We're doing some in the region of about 60, 70 events across the country, similar to what we did to last year. We've invited ELS expirees from this year and last year uh, to those events. So if people are interested in countryside stewardship, uh, we're applying for countryside stewardship, we're actively encouraging them to attend one of those events, get an overview of the scheme, um, get some information about the local priorities, uh, and then what further support would be available to them going forward. In terms of today, we're going to set, just learning some of the lessons from last year, set some of the context around the uh, countryside stewardship and changes from environmental stewardship, some of the improvements that we've made since last year, then we're going to go into the scheme overview, how it works, some more of the differences with ELS. Then we're going to go into local priorities and option selection, and particularly wild pollinator um, and farm wildlife package and improving water quality, which will be covered by James and um, Philippa. Then we're going to go through some of the detailed application steps, the application process for touching the capital grants and why you should apply. Um, as I say, we need to finish up one. Um, I will be speaking for most of this, but I'm going to pause every few slides to take any questions via chat. So if there are questions, please submit them. Okay. Um, so I think first, first things first, why should people consider applying for countryside stewardship? Um, it's a flexible scheme. It's to fit with your business. Um, you know, in developing this scheme, we have uh, been worked very closely with the industry and farmers and built an experience for environmental stewardship. So it's about flexibility and working within business. It, it integrates both farming and forestry, and we'll come on to this in due course, but one of the key changes around countryside stewardship from, from um, environmental stewardship is a more integrated land management scheme than previously. It makes your business more sustainable, both in terms of environmental outcomes and actually the fixed revenue over a five-year um, period, uh, provides a chance to learn new things, and also gives an opportunity to demonstrate environmental credentials. We know through environmental stewardship, uh, the number of people who applied the potential to land that was under the, the schemes, a lot of people got quite a lot, both in terms of what it did for the environment, but actually for the credentials it provided um, to, to their peers and uh, the, the wider public. 
As I say, environmental stewardship, um, the previous scheme, it delivered an awful lot. Uh, the infographic which you have in front of you, sort of just a quick summary of some of the things that environmental stewardship did deliver and still does deliver, bearing in mind that there's still a lot of people in those schemes. Um, but the reality is that wildlife continues to decline, water resources still under pressure, soils continue to degrade. Um, which is why we needed to move to a new countryside stewardship scheme, um, improve value for um, public money, improve environmental pubs and public goods. It's about getting the right options in the right place, the right combination, at the right scale, um, a more targeted and selective and competitive scheme. So environmental stewardship is open to all. There's effectively points make prizes. We know it delivered a lot, uh, particularly ELS was a particularly powerful tool in engaging uh, many farmers with agri-environment schemes. But equally, we know that it paid many people for doing things they were already doing and didn't deliver as much on the ground as we would have liked, which is why we moved to countryside stewardship, a more targeted, selective and competitive scheme um, that will deliver uh, a bigger bang for its buck, so to speak. Uh, just touching on uh, some of the lessons we learned from last year. Uh, last year was, let's say, well, relatively exceptional. Um, first year of the scheme, they're always challenging. Uh, they were various challenges we had to deal with, but we've learned a lot um, and we made some significant improvements from last year based on very much feedback from agents, stakeholders and our customers and indeed staff. Um, just a quick summary of some of those improvements. You know, one of the key bits of feedback was about guidance, making sure it's earlier, fixed and farmer friendly. We've now published both um, mid-tier and higher-tier guidance separate PDFs that went live on March the 14th. We made sure it's as farmer friendly as possible and worked with the Game of the Wildlife Conservation Trust who reviewed that guidance uh, to make it as sort of intuitive and farmer friendly as we could, we can. Uh, there's a new online option selection tool aligning local priorities and option choice. Again, one of the biggest challenges last year was um, uh, the bridging the gap between identifying local priorities and choosing the right options to address those local priorities. There's a new new tool available on the Rural Payment Service which uh, uh, land managers or customers will go through a series of questions and that will help identify the priority options in their local area. Uh, again, one of the major challenges we had last year was the minimum, uh, the 5K uh, threshold in terms of expenditure which for many uplands farmers and small farmers became a barrier to uptake. So we suspended that minimum 5K threshold this year. We've made some um, changes to some of our options, which we'll come on to, which make sure that the options are more accessible to many of the upland farmers. App application windows, they're open longer. The scheme is now open. The guidance is available from March 14th to mid-year. Application windows closes on 30th of September. That's a good three months longer than it was open last year. Guidance is available, so again, hopefully that's a significant improvement. Um, many of you will be aware of the challenges we had around the targeting data, which was available on the interactive PDFs, uh, available on .gov. They are still there, but actually that targeting data is now, or a lot of that targeting data is now available on MAGIC, uh, which is a much more intuitive, for user-friendly tool. It's not all there yet, and there will be more data going live in the next couple of weeks. Um, when all that targeting data is available on MAGIC, we'll then switch off the IPDS. Um, we know that a lot of challenges around uh, sampling approach and for photography in particular. Um, we've made some improvements. We, there's only so far we can go in terms of the EC uh, constraints around this, but in terms of photography, uh, we we're basically adopting a sampling approach between 5 and 10 percent. And those people who will need to provide photographs will be told, uh, will be writing out in April, and they'll have to provide the uh, photographs in October. So. Um, we're really hopefully reducing the burden around that. We're also, we've also made some improvements to soil sampling requirements, and we've also made further clear guidance and templates available for livestock movement records. So they're just some of the improvements we made this year, but hopefully they'll be quite significant and substantive in terms of uptake of countryside stewardship. Um, oh, pressing the wrong button. Um, just touching on the new CS Online Options tool, uh, a couple of slides on this, but it's a really it's a significant improvement to the scheme. Uh, the tool is available to everyone who's registered on rural payments. So, you know, all, and I think the vast majority of customers now, and indeed agents, are registered on rural payments. So, you, 
by logging onto the tool, uh, raw payments will get access to the countryside stewardship options tool. The tool is based on a series of questions that uh, um, you need to, you have to answer. So you identify your business, you'll then go to the options tool, you answer those questions. Um, there's various simple yes, no questions. You need to go through them all. Once you've gone through those questions, that will identify the local, um, the priority options, or the, the high scoring options uh, for an agreement in your local area. Um, now, just a quick point around agents, because I know we're talking to many agents here today. Uh, agents will need to be registered on the Rural Payment Service, and I know the vast majority are, but there might be some, particularly those who specialise on countryside stewardship, who aren't yet registered. You can register by going to the Rural Payment Service and following the instructions there. Uh, to have access to that tool, uh, you might already be empowered, so if you've done a BPS claim last year, you would already have access to the CS Online Options tool. If not, you will need to get your customer to give you access to that tool, so they will have to empower you to have access to their business so you can then use the rural payments tool. Um, just again, quick point on agents authorisation, because I know we've got quite a few agents uh, with us today. Um, there was the, we originally intended to do online authorisation, that's not happening this year, so we're staying with paper-based agents authorisation forms for both the mid-tier, high-tier and capital only. Uh, the permissions that was originally on rural payments, which is now being switched off, isn't working. That will be reinstated for next year. Uh, if you have already used permissions on, for CS and rural payments, and I believe there's literally a, a, a very small handful, apologies, uh, that, that those permissions are effectively redundant. You'll need to um, complete paper applications again this year. Any paper applications that are submitted this year are not going to be automatically transferred into the system in 2017. So there will be, and it should be a very simple task, to get permissions, for, uh, a case of getting permissions for um, agents getting permissions on the tool next year. Um, but again, just to kind of reiterate the point, if you're an agent and you're doing countryside stewardship um, agreements this year, if you're not yet registered on a rural payments tool, please do so and make sure that any customers that you're working with are giving you permission to access the tool because that would be really helpful. Uh, okay. Moving on, I'll just one or two more slides and then we'll pause for some questions. Um, just to reiterate some of the points, particularly around the uplands, and these are, are wider improvements, but they are very much um, help to uh, target the upland farmers. So as I've already mentioned, the 5,000 minimum value required for mid-tier has been suspended. Last year there was a minimum value spend of over five-year period of um, £5,000, so that's approximately £1,000 a year. Uh, we know that there was a bit of a barrier to uptake for um, some of the smaller farmers and upland farmers, so that um, has been suspended. Um, we revised the eligibility um, uh, for low input grasslands, GS2, uh, lowlands and GS5 uplands to include parcels adjacent to watercourse. Again, based very much on feedback from the likes of, of our customers and agents. We're relaxing soil testing requirements for GS5 and GS2, so they only need levels of uh, pH and phosphates. Again, more standard industry practice, we knew that was a bit of a barrier and a challenge. But we've added lenient grazing GS17, cattle grazing SP6, and hay making supplements so they can be used with low input grass and options in um, severely disadvantaged areas. I'm afraid I'm not technical enough to be able to talk you through some of the detail around that, but it's a key improvement that, again, the industry has asked for. And we're making a livestock exclusion supplement to scrub management WD9 available above the moorland line to help with flood risk management of particular species. So some uh, not insignificant improvements to the scheme, but we know based on the feedback from both our customers, um, agents, and stakeholders, these are kind of key improvements that we needed to make for this year. Um, moving on, again, I've already touched on the application windows, but again, we published this, uh, I think, probably about a couple of months ago now, highlights the application windows. Um, for this year, we've opened the scheme much earlier. Both the, the scheme effectively opened on March the 14th. Application forms are available for both higher tier and mid tier. Full guidance has been published. Um, People who are considering putting forward a, a higher tier pre-application, uh, deadline is the 30th of April. I need to stress, I know that's a challenging time frame, 
but we're not looking at a full application here. This is like almost a, an initial expression of in, um, uh, intent. So the application forms are available. Actually, many people who are who've got HIV inspired yeah, are already being contacted by Natural England advisors. So for higher tier agreements, they need to be supported through um, higher tier. So the deadline for those um, initial applications for higher tier is the 30th of April. For mid tier. The, the application window opened on the 14th of March and closes on the 30th of September. Part of the reason we've uh, put in place the deadline of 30th of April for uh, higher tier applications is again based on feedback from yourselves is that those customers who might put forward a higher tier application but were then not suitable to go forward with a higher tier agreement wanted to know early so they could effectively have enough time to switch from their higher tier application to mid tier. So all high tier customers will know in early June whether they're going to be taken forward or not. Um, and for those who are not suitable for a high tier application, they'll have plenty of time to work up their mid-tier agreement. Just moving on. Um, I'll pause there for any questions, although I don't think actually I've seen any come in. Rebecca, can you see any questions? No, there isn't. Um, Brandon, you've raised your hand, so if you could submit your question via chat. Um, we'll pick that up next time then, Alex. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, so just to repeat, the chat functionality is a little speech bot bubble, top right-hand corner of the screen. Mine's blue, but I think that's probably because I've clicked it. If you click on that, um, bring up the chat functionality and just sit, submit the question. Using the every, send it to everyone, because that way we can all see. That would be very helpful. Okay, I'll, I'll plow on regardless. Um, I know looking at some of the names on this uh, who've joined us that they've probably heard this, uh, these slides in one way, shape, or form on a number of occasions in the last couple of months, so uh, I'm not surprised if uh, they don't have any questions. So just a quick recap on the scheme, countryside stewardship. You know, it is different from environmental stewardship. It's an integrated scheme delivered by Natural England Forestry Commission. I think one of the myths that have been circulating in the last sort of four or five months is Natural England are delivering the scheme, the woodland element of the scheme. That's not right. We are working very closely with the Forestry Commission. It's an integrated scheme, and uh, we are actually doing the processing of applications for FC, but FC is still providing that specialist on the ground support. But in terms of application forms, etc., we're doing that sort of back end processing for them. Uh, CS replaces environmental stewardship, EWGS, and the capital grants and catchment sensitive farming. And uh, Philip will come to uh, CSF uh, shortly. One of the major changes, uh, pretty, you know, really important, is it's a competitive targeted scheme with grants being awarded to those who make the biggest improvements in their local area. Environmental stewardship was, you know, there was a baseline, uh, basic number of points. You got those, everyone got a scheme. You know, and today it's in the age where we've got resources that are, are limited. We want to make sure that we are um, giving grants to those people who deliver the most for the, the, their local environment. Um, and we will touch on scoring in due course. Um, but it does mean that not everybody applies will um, be successful. That said, again, some of the myths that are going around is it's incredibly difficult to get into the scheme. That's not right. If you put the right options in the right place to address the local environmental priorities at the right scale, i.e. you put together a good agreement, the chances are you'll get an agreement. Um, but what we want to avoid is some of the agreements that we had last through environmental stewardship where effectively we had some very poor quality agreements that were effectively delivering very little for the local environment. Um, and, you know, it, so if you're putting agreements like that, chances are they won't be successful. But if you're putting in agreements to meet the local priorities uh, with a range of different options, uh, ideally multi-objective um, options that meet the local priorities, chances are you'll get a good agreement. Another really significant change from environmental stewardship that's worth noting, um, and I have to be honest, probably caused us some of the, our biggest challenges, is that we've got a fixed application window. So just to repeat, so for mid-tier it's from 14th of March through to the 30th of September, and a single start date. So with, unlike environmental stewardship where agreements started on a rolling basis and started at the beginning of each month, now all agreements so all, uh, start on the 1st of January of each year. So applications for this year will start on the 1st of January 2017. Um, 
how the scheme will help the environment. There's kind of the, the four main priorities, but these are not exclusive. Wildlife and nature, pollinators, water and flooding, and woodlands, reflecting the more integrated approach. The other priorities, which again, very similar to environmental stewardship, historic environment, landscape character, genetic conservation, ed access, climate change adaptation and mitigation, but the, the, the kind of priority focus of the scheme, wildlife and nature pollinators, water and flooding in woodland. Um, hopefully there's no surprises to anyone there. Uh, okay, let's come to questions in a moment. Um, just do two more slides and then we'll pause because I think we've got a couple of questions coming in. Uh, how is the scheme designed? Again, it's not a million miles away from where we were environmental stewardship. So we've got mid-tier, which I suppose is, is most closely aligned to ELS, but key changes, it's, you know, uh, it's part farm, it's competitive, it's targeted. We've got higher tier, again, very similar to HLS, uh, and then we've got capital grants. So mid-tier, multi-objective, widespread uptake, simpler management, so but, which, mean, which mean, we mean hands-off, um, tend to be five years. Higher tier, multi-objective, site-specific, more tailored, so the options around higher tier can be tailored. Uh, agreements, again, on standard five years, but in some cases they might be longer. And then capital grants, single objective, capital only, two year, but the management has to write uh, line for five years. Really important point here, really key message for everyone, um, is that actually the same, we've got the same options across the, uh, all parts of the scheme, although they can be tailored in higher tier, but the payment rates tend to be the same, uh, be it in capital, mid or high tier. It's a really important point um, that people uh, is worth reflecting on. Um, again, just reflecting on some of the feedback from last year and the perceived, and actually, let's say, to be honest, some of the complexity around the scheme, we developed a kind of what we hope is a simple infographic, infographic illustrating how the different parts of the scheme work. This is available on the um, cs.gov pages, um, been developed using some lots of input and insight and feedback from various stakeholders. Just to kind of, uh, hopefully it will help um, people understand how the scheme works. But the bottom we've got the, the green, which is the capital grants. It's a range of capital grants, hedgerow boundaries, woodland management, woodland creation, treehouse support. They have different application windows throughout the year. Uh, hedgerows and boundaries, I believe, off the top of my head, is uh, due to finish at the end of this month. Uh, but these are really simple capital grant schemes. Uh, they are designed to be very simple. Um, then in the uh, kind of a yellowy area, we've got the mid-tier, as I already said. Uh, it's a, a, a broader scheme, competitive and targeted, um, similar to ELS, but, you know, as I say, more competitive and targeted. So, People who apply for mid-tier will get an uplift in terms of their scores and points if they are they adopt the wild pollinator and wild farm wildlife package, which James will come to shortly. Uh, they do um, improving water quality um, priority in priority areas, or they're part of facilitation funds. So if they are part of facilitation fund, they're working together with other farmers in their local communities to address local um, local priorities, and they want to become part of a, a, a mid mid-tier scheme, they will get additional points for that, kind of to recognize that join up. And then a higher tier, which is the pink red level, uh, again, as I've already mentioned, that's a more complex site, primarily, not exclusively, triple SIs, common land, priority habitats. It requires support from Natural England or an FC advisor, depending on the nature of the scheme, um, and those options can be tailored. Uh, so. Uh, so that hopefully just illustrates how the different parts of the scheme fit together. Um, let's move on one more. So let's just pause there, partially so I can get my breath, and partially so we can get some deal with any questions. Um, so who have we got questions coming in from? Uh, one from Brendan here. I'm delivering CSS clinics and one-to-one -one training. I need a dummy. Options tool. Uh, Brendan, I'm guessing you're part of the FAT contract. Uh, we've done a number of webinars for you guys already, and yes, we are looking to set up a uh, dummy account to provide access to um, you know, the, those who are presenting at those events so you can demonstrate the tool. Um, details on that will be coming shortly. Um, 
And then we've got one from Isabel to everyone. Why are water grants not included in the green stripe at the bottom? I think that's green, yellow, pink slide. Uh, it's a good question, Isabel, and that's basically relates to the fact that we don't do standalone water capital grants anymore. Uh, the capital grants are effectively uh, applied for, the water capital items are applied for as part of a mid-tier agreement. So they don't, they don't work as standalone capital grants in that purest sense, recognizing it's not, it's, a bit of, it's not totally as clear as it could be, but it's the capital items that used to be a standalone capital grants are now integrated as part of a mid-tier application. I hope that answers that question. I suspect there might be some further questions on that we, we can come on to in due course. Um, don't have any other questions coming in at the moment, so we'll move on. But if you do have questions, submit them. Uh, there is no such thing as a daft question. Um, and then if you've got questions, I'm sure others would appreciate the answers. So let's do a bit of shared learning there. Uh, just to recap, some of the key differences with ELS. We will come back to this because it's a new scheme and we know it's taken people a while to get their heads around. Uh, ALS used to be available to all based on 30 points per hectare. Mid-tier countryside stewardship is available to all, as long as they're eligible to apply, but it's a competitive scheme. ALS used to be flat payment rate uh, across the piece. For mid-tier, payments depend on the options being adopted. Um, for ELS, it was a whole farm. So what you applied for, so the land you put into your ELS agreement was across the whole farm. So all that agreement applies to the whole farm. For mid-tier, it's part farm, so it's just the land that you're putting into agreement that's um, included in that agreement. Uh, ELS is already touched on as apply at any time. We had rolling application windows. Um, unfortunately, we've now had to move to fixed application window. This is part of the EC um, compliance audit. Um, and again, we said rolling monthly start dates and single annual start date. So applications that are worked up or submitted this year will have a 1st of January start date. Um, we touched on this um, in the earlier slides. We're talking about uh, local environmental priorities. One of the, you know, the, the, the kind of primary design principles around countryside stewardship is around getting the right options in at the right place to address local priorities. Now, the question then stays, well, how do I know what my local priorities are or how are they defined? Um, there's a number of different sources of this information, um, and I think it's fair to say that, you know, there's going to be, there's always going to be some gaps in that information. I can come on to why in due course. Um, one of the primary sources is statements of priorities uh, that they are published on our website. They've been developed over a number of years with a lot of input from local stakeholders, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they are a tool that's used for a variety of different purposes, not just countryside stewardship. They're not being reviewed at the moment because we know that there's some anomalies in there, but uh, they're not going to be reviewed or refined at the moment. Statement priorities are a good starting point to identify what some of the local priorities are in the local area. Related to those, we produced last year some interactive PDFs. We know they were a big, rather cumbersome tool, but they were um, all, all, all we could do at the time to bridge the gap between what we were hoping the IT would provide and where we found ourselves. So the interactive PDFs are there. They have various layers, data layers which you can switch on and off, which you can drill down to almost at a parcel level to identify some of those local priorities. We know they were clunky and we know that the file sizes were in many instances absolutely huge. Um, reflecting that and to make those improvements, we're now in the process of updating MAGIC, which we know is a tool that gets widely used across the piece. Uh, if you now go on to MAGIC, anyone could log on, there's countryside stewardship data layers. We are continually update, continuously updating those data layers. Um, a lot of the data that we use for targeting is held by third parties, and in order for us to publish that information, we need to get their um, authorization. I have to say, in some instances, that's taking longer to achieve than we would expected. So we know at this stage that uh, the, the, the data on MAGIC is not comprehensive, but uh, it's growing week by week, and we're expecting a, lot, a big um, upload, actually, in the next nine days. So any data gaps there will hopefully be addressed. Um, 
So that will then be a much easier targeting tool for uh, to identify local priorities. And uh, in addition to that, I've already mentioned, we've got the CS uh, online option tool, which is available rural payments. That effectively uses the targeting data that sits on MAGIC to help identify, based on someone's farm business and its location, what the priority options are for an go countryside stewardship material agreement. Um, I'll just okay. Um, just pop, pause to take some questions here because we've got one or two coming in, and I could do with a sip of water. So we've had a question come in from John: uh, Is the 5K threshold suspended for just one year? Uh, at the moment, John, I think it very much depends on the, the, the base. We're working on the principle that it's suspended for one year. Uh, I think that will be reviewed in the fullness of time, but at the moment it's, it's based on a one-year suspension. Bless you to whoever sneezed then. Um, uh, and I think Philip has already addressed the, the point around uh, water capital items uh, being part and parcel of the mid-tier agreement. So moving back to the slide, options and items. Um, again, hopefully many of you will already be familiar with the range of countryside stewardship uh, options. There is a tool that was available last year, Countryside Stewardship Grant Finder. Apologies, the name's a bit misleading, but we've got, we're rather concerned about what we can do for that. It's an online tool, so if you go to the Countryside Stewardship pages on .gov, go to the Grant Finder tool, uh, there's, a, a, there's a basically search facilities that you can look at all the different options that are available under Countryside Stewardship uh, for both mid-tier, capital, uh, for arable, for uplands. You can search according to uh, particular requirements. Um, there are 131 for mid-tier specifically. Uh, nearly all of those options are available for high-tier uh, that they're scoped to tailor. And actually, in terms of those options, a lot of the, the, the payment rates, the management requirements, the prescriptions, etc., are all laid out on those um, options tools. So again, if you're not familiar or you haven't used it, strongly recommend you take some time to have a look at that, familiarise yourself with those options. Uh, as I mentioned, it's about getting the right options, the right place, the right outcomes. So by going through rural payments and using the option tool, you can identify what the high priority options are for a particular area on a particular farm. That links you through to this grant finder tool, which then gives you the details of each of those options. You can then consider what are the best options in terms of the farm practices to make that work. Um, just moving on. Again, we talked on uh, the, the options tool. So by going through the options tool, you can identify your, your register, your, you'll know about your land business, you click on there, you can answer a series of questions about what you want to do in terms of um, environmental priorities in your business. That will provide, identify the high scoring options for a particular agreement on that land. You can then drill down into those options and consider what the payment rate is, what the management requirements are before putting your application together. Uh, okay, enough from me. Uh, we're then going on to the Wild Pollination Farm Wildlife Package. Uh, so, James, uh, are you with us? I am indeed, yes. I've just unmuted myself. Can everyone hear me? Okay. I think they're all mute, so we'll assume yes. Uh, so, James, I'll hand over to you just to take everyone through the, the package. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, in fact. Uh, I'm just going to just take you through uh, five or six slides on the wild pollinator and farm wildlife package and how we want to use it and uh, put it in place for mid-tier. So basically, the wild pollinator package expands the uh, environmental stewardship farm and bird package and the big three approach. Uh, we've designed it and modified it to deliver for wild pollinators. Uh, the package, basically, we want the package to be put in place. It's got proven delivery of biodiversity outcomes. It does make it easier to develop a good, well-paying agreement, and there is a better chance of a successful application. An increased score for doing the package, plus extra points if applied in what in what farm and bird and wild pollinator target areas in the low in in most of lowland England. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Uh, basically, the package is a bundle of options, 21 options in mid-tier, 
and it's designed to benefit wild pollinators and other farm wildlife. It's all about the right options at the right scale at the right place, and it does increase the chance of a successful application mid-tier, and it's a minimum of 3% of the land in the, in the CS applications needs to be the, the options that make up the package to get the uplift. Next slide. So basically, it's, it's about choosing options that are suitable to arable, mixed, or pastoral farms. Choose the options that provide the three essential wildlife resources. So it's all about nectar and, nectar and pollen sources for pollinators and insect-rich foraging habitat for birds. We want to provide nesting, hibernation, and sheltering habitat for pollinators and birds, and then also winter food for seed-eating birds. Many of the options can be co-located on EFAs, but payments will be reduced to prevent double funding. You can also add additional options to the package, such as buffering of ponds and skylark plots. And to reiterate, the Wild Pollination Farm Wildlife Package contains those specific group of management options that when deployed in the right way and in the right place, in the right combination at the, and in, at the right scale, will benefit wild pollinators and farm birds, species such as grey partridge, tree sparrow and yellowhammer, and other farm wildlife associated with the wilder countryside. So species such as grey crested newts, bats, brown hare, and rare arable plants. There is a focus on the resource needs of wild pollinators and farm birds specifically, but we really have looked at the design of the package so we can cater for the needs of other priority wildlife found across lowland farmland in England. Uh, just to say that we've got a lot more detail in Annex 3 uh, in the mid-tier guidance on, on gov.uk. There's some more, far more detail there about, about how to put together uh, a package. Next slide, please. So I just want to just give a couple of examples, uh, an arable example, firstly. So for this example, we're looking at 250 hectare arable farm on heavy land with mainly winter cropping with some high quality hedgerows. So to deliver the mid-tier package, we want to see pollen and nectar and insect food. So 1.5 hectares of AB1 nectar flower mix and one hectare of AB8 flower rich margins and plots. And then also then winter seed for farming birds, maybe five hectares of AB9 winter bird food. And the payment there would, would come to four and a half thousand pounds per annum. Instead of AB9, could do 25 hectares of AB2 basic overwinter stubble, or 12.5 hectares of AB6 enhanced overwinter stubble, or a combination of the two. Also worth considering B, B3 management of hedgerows of high environmental value, and AB4 skylark plots as additional options. A mix of legume AB1 and perennial AB8 flowers gives the best delivery for a a wide range of species across the season. Although, and also, although not formally part of the arable mixed packages, we should also encourage AB5 nesting flocks for lapwing, if lapwings are present on the holding. And possibly supplementary winter feeding for farm and birds, that's AB12, if the, re if the requirements can be met by the applicant. Both of these options are available in mid-tier. And so in supplementary winter feeding really does deliver a really good uh, food for farm birds during that key winter hungry gap period, sort of January through to April. Next slide, please. So for the pastoral example, basically this would be a 50 hectare grass farm, 100% grass farm, that has some quality hedgerows, some semi improved grassland and some ponds. So we'd be looking for this, we'd be looking for say 0.5 hectares of GS4 legume and herbivorous sward, 0.5 hectares of GS2 permanent grass with low, very, very low inputs, 0.25 hectares of GS1, that's about taking field corners out of management, and 250 meters of B3 management of hedgerows of high environmental value. The payment for that would be 300 pounds per annum, and you could consider GS17 
lean in grey, grazing supplement, GS3, ryegrass, seed set, for winter foods, spring food for farm birds, and then also maybe WT1 buffering in field ponds and ditches in improved grassland. So you could use those as additional options to the package. Um, it's just also worth considering, um, as already Alex has already said, the minimum of payment under concise stewardship of £5,000 has been suspended. So the applicant could apply as, as we've set in this example. But I do think it would be prudent to add other options to the application to ensure it's delivering against a, a wider range of local environmental priorities. And this would ensure that it would score very well. Uh, just to say, mixed farms could choose from arable and grassland options. Uh, so that we've not included that as an example here. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, just to say that, just finally on my last, uh, my last slide, I just wanted to say that more detail has been, will be provided in Annex 3 of the, uh, on gov.uk, on gov which gives more detail on the package, particularly pages 97 to pages 104. And we did do a specific uh, webinar this morning on giving some more detail around the package, um, more technical detail, and we will make that recording available, and we will send a PDF of that presentation around to those who, who wish to have it. Thank you. Thanks, James. Just before we go on to Philippa, uh, I just reiterate your points about the, uh, which I had to say, it was an excellent webinar this morning going into some of the detail around the package. We had a lot of really very detailed questions coming in. Uh, we'll make that recording available, I think, hopefully early next week, and uh, intention is to publish that on the CS pages on .gov, uh, similar to this, to kind of create a, a, a suite of learning products. Um, for everyone, so uh, we'll make sure that goes that goes out to people who've registered for this um, webinar. <clears throat> Before we move on to Philip around improving water quality and just picking up some of the points there, um, that we've had a question in from Anna or Anne, sorry Anne. Uh, any upland pastoral areas now eligible and appropriate for the pollination wild part, wildlife package, please? Um, it's just it's just worth saying. Um, the farm wildlife package is not available in SDAs at, at the moment. The evidence experience on which we've based the, uh, the, the design of the package does come from lowland farms, and that's quite important. We need to keep it evidence-based. But uh, following changes, following 2016 changes to CS, I do think it is now possible to build a good mid-tier agreement on an upland farm that will benefit the wildlife associated with the uplands. I think that's quite important to reiterate that. So, you know, we've got options in mid-tier that will benefit uh, breeding waders, and we've got high scoring priority options that, when targeted in the uplands, will score highly. Um, so I think that's quite important to, to, to say that. Also, I think we are now thinking about looking at how we might be able to sort of develop uh, a farm wildlife package specifically tailored for the uplands, and I think we will be looking at that in the coming year. But I think it's very important that we must what we have, whatever we design, whatever we develop, has to be evidence-based, and so we need to make sure we have the evidence that what we what we put in place actually makes a difference for the species that we're targeting. Fantastic, thank you, James. Now, um, handing over to Philippa, who um, hopefully is somewhere out there, to talk us through some of the improving water quality slides. Yeah, I'm here. Thanks, Alex. Okay, I've just got three slides on improving water quality. Um, so water quality is now a main objective of countryside stewardship. Um, so we've got a lot more in the new scheme than we had previously. A whole range of capital items, um, many of the ones which used to be in the CSF capital grant scheme are in there, and a whole raft of land management options. Um, they're all available through the higher tier. But most of these are actually available through the mid-tier, and, and that's where we're, we're aiming most of our, um, our work will be um, through the mid-tier and supporting the farmers with mid-tier applications that include water quality where appropriate. 
So stewardship now funds activities which reduce water pollution from agriculture. So this includes pollutants um, such as nutrients, sediment, pesticides, and fecal indicator organisms that are found in, um, in manures. Um, and the aim of these is to improve aquatic habitats and to support target species which are affected by poor water quality, in particular for designated sites. But also they're targeted at protecting protected areas such as bathing waters, shellfish waters, uh, and drinking water protected areas. Um, and also water bodies that are failing WFD because of water quality issues. A lot of the options also have wider environmental benefits in terms of soil quality and flood risk, climate change mitigation, water resources, and land-based wildlife. So there are other benefits that you can get from using these options. And they're designed Philippa. to be used. So, sorry, okay. Philippa. Can you just speak up a bit? We've just had a few comments that you're quite quiet. OK. Sorry, Thank I'm you. louder. Thank you. So um, the country stewardship options are, um, just are tied in very closely with the catchment sensitive farming project now. So CSF is providing advice and support to farmers. Um, and much of this is um, like aligned with the country stewardship options. So for example, um, a farmer may have a CSF advice visit which will recommend um, a range of options or, and how to use them. Or CSS advice may be used to help design that particular option. Just a reminder that um, water capital items now need to use the mid-tier countryside stewardship application forms. It's still possible to get water capital items um, alone, a standalone item. Um, it doesn't have to be with land, land management options, uh, but they use the same application process. Next slide, please. So in terms of targeting, um, you can see on the map the pinky red areas are the high priority areas for water quality and the yellowy buff areas are the medium priority areas for water quality. So um, the focus of CSF will be now be in the pinky red areas um, on the map also. You can see in the green boundaries, which is the outline of the priority catchments where CSF was pre previously targeted. So most of the areas that we were working in before are still covered by the Controlled Stewardship Targeting, but there are some areas that we've moved away from, and there are some new areas that um, are being covered by the Controlled Stewardship Targeting. Um, so the CSFOs are, um, are now working to these new high priority areas and will be providing support for farmers applying for stewardship in those areas, um, working proactively with selected farms. Um, we'll also be making use of the FAF um, contract to provide support for farmers so that um, some of you on the call will be doing some of the visits to support mid-tier applications as well. Um, so we're, we're basically prioritizing farms where uh, there's a higher risk of water quality impacting a sensitive area where the country strategic options and grants available are um, going to make, make an impact, so um, where they can be most effective, essentially. All of these targeting areas are available um, to see on MAGIC um, now, so um, it's, it's worth checking before you go and visit a, a farm or for farmers to check themselves to find out whether they're in a high water priority area um, and they're likely to get countryside stewardship water quality options high, scoring higher um, and whether they can get some support from CSF. Next slide, please. So there's two different routes through the mid-tier for applying for water capital items now. So um, water capital items are available 
um, with land management options as part of a five-year agreement or as water capital only. Um, both routes are competitive, so they'll be scored against local priorities and they both follow the same application process using the mid application form. Um, so that all applications will be scored by CSF where they're for water quality and there'll be a higher score where um, particular issues, water quality issues that have been identified through the scoring process and on the farm have been appropriately addressed. So again, as with the pollinator packages, it's the right option, the right item in the right place to have the impact to improve water quality. Um, a water capital items only application um, an agreement is two years and that's limited to £10,000 per application. It is possible to apply for one of these on top of an existing environmental stewardship agreement um, as long as the item that you're applying for is not on the same parcel where there's a, um, an existing option through an ES agreement. So a lot of farms that we'll be targeting through CSF are ones that are coming out of ELS or ones where we can um, provide capital items in addition. CSF will be providing support to farmers within the high water quality um, priority areas, but we will be um, prioritising how we support and which farms we support so that we will have the most impact. Um, so it's worth kind of identifying what the issues are, whether they're in those high priority areas and what the options are available to them. There are, are a range of items which we term risky items, the same as last year, which are only available with approval from CSF um, within the high water priority area. So um, those include yard work, some of the pesticide items, for example, where we want to make sure that they're used in the right place. Um, and also to, to make sure that they're not overused. Um, so it's worth uh, um, contacting your CSFO if, if you think um, the farmer is interested in applying for those particular items, but only if they're in the high water priority area. Um, okay, I think that's everything. Thanks, Philippa. Very helpful. Um, well, we'll just go through a couple of CFE slides. Um, so I have to acknowledge, I think, I'm probably in slightly wrong place in this presentation. But, uh, 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 and then we'll pause for any questions. I know Susan's coming with one question, which we'll come to. But if anybody else has got any questions around uh, the water quality or indeed the wild farm um, and bird package, uh, that submit them and we'll pause in a minute to take some questions. Um, as I say, I think these slides are in the wrong place, so I'm near culprit on that. But uh, uh, we're really keen uh, to reflect that, you know, as, as part of the presentation around countryside stewardship, recognising that not not everyone is going to be um, uh, countryside stewardship isn't going to be appropriate for everyone. We want to make sure that we reference to a, um, a kind of giving appropriate exposure to the campaign for the farmed environment. Uh, we know a lot of people coming out of ELS. Uh, we know. You know, many will be interested in countryside stewardship, but not all. And for those people who are not going into countryside stewardship, we're obviously very keen, well, both Metro England, but actually all partners involved in CFE, that the environmental benefits from those ELS agreements are retained. Um, so uh, you know, thanks to uh, CFE and NFU, they've provided us with a couple of key um, slides around this. So you know, why should you keep your land in environmental management, be it in an agri-environment scheme or not? You know, why not to keep your options open? We don't know what the future looks like. Basically, to continue the good work uh, that we've done already, um, and we've already referenced the point that actually, you know, one of the benefits of agri-environment schemes, and indeed CFE, is you know, the recognition it delivers both in terms of wider farming peers, but the wider public, um, and support your farm business increase profitability. You know, there's a growing bank of evidence about the, the profitability of uh, increased uh, pollinator. Um, 
colonies on farms. And I think Sainsbury's done some very interesting work about how um, the uh, wild pollinators uh, can, can increase the productivity of top fruit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a, a range of benefits for keeping within the scheme. Um, are keeping the, the, those environmental options under CFE. Many of you will know those better than me. Uh, the benefits of the CFE voluntary measures, they can play a key part in terms of the BPS claims, including EFE requirements. So even if your ELSs are coming to an end, maintaining some of those um, uh, options will help towards your EFE, EFA requirements. Helps prevent soil erosion, increase soil quality. And I know earlier today on the uh, uh, wild pollinator package, there was an interesting um, discussion, points made around the importance of um, healthy soil, and you know, the CFE voluntary measures can go a long way to delivering that. Healthy soil, increase, increase soil quality, profitable businesses. Buffer strips and field margins can allow access for hedge cutting. Um, concentrate efforts on the most productive land, keep the marginal land out of production. So, you know, again, one of the key messages around CFE is right options, right place, um, uh, uh, right scale. Uh, and we know there's lots of land, or there is land on farms that is not particularly productive. And actually, the Inter and Agri Environment Scheme, Countryside Stewardship or Environmental Stewardship, or voluntarily, you know, it, it, it's sometimes better to leave that uh, land to nature rather than you know, putting it into production where you might actually kind of the inputs that way, the outputs. Um, sorry, pressing wrong buttons on this presentation here. Um, again, you know, some of the key messages to CFE, and uh, again, point made that I think these slides are perhaps probably the wrong place in the presentation. Supports pollinating insects on farm by putting in flower strips. Helps support birds you like to see on your farm. Um, CFE demonstrates the wider public and environment is much, it's very much part of farming business. Um, you know, it's a really key message nowadays. And um, for those who are interested, and this is something that gets picked up, will need to get picked up, particularly at the FAF events. Those people who are interested in CFE who are not already signed up and not aware, you know, there's a web page where there's a lot of really useful information and resources. So, um, slight sort of offset from countryside stewardship, but it's actually really important that those farmers who do have ELS agreements that expire this year, who might not, think, might not want to go into countryside stewardship, really actively encourage them to consider the CFE voluntary options. And you, as land agents, key advisors and intermediaries, really strongly encourage you and um, would you know, ask for your help to encourage those people to consider CFE voluntary options as part of their wider farm business. Um, now, back to the more, uh, um, uh, I tend to say mundane, but the, the, the subject in hand. Uh, the next phase of this presentation, and we've got just shy of half, or just over half an hour left, is really kind of some of the detail around how to apply. I'm going to go through some of this at pace, because hopefully many of you will already be very familiar with this, particularly the first part of the um, uh, the slides, and then we can go through some more detail. Again, if you have any questions, uh, please submit them via the chat function. Um, you know, it really does help us, both in terms of refining these presentations, but everyone's wider learning and understanding by getting those questions submitted. <laughs> so, how do you apply for countryside stewardship? <clears throat> First of all, you need to be registered on rural payments. Um, everyone who wants to get paid through a countryside stewardship agreement or indeed have access to the options tool and needs to be registered on rural payments. I think this is less of a challenge than it was last year because I think the vast majority of people have already registered uh, in terms of their BPS payments. So if you're not registered, you do need to do so. Um, that's both in terms of customers, but equally, as I mentioned earlier, agents who might want to act on behalf of those customers. So you need to register on rural payments. You need to get an application pack, uh, and you can get those through Natural England, as I say, window open the 14th of March. Uh, you can request application packs via email, but really recommend that you do that via the phone. The reason we need to call is because actually we need to understand what land you want to put into an agreement so we can develop the supporting maps. Um, information that you'll need to have to hand when uh, uh, requesting an application pack, name and address of the um, uh, proposed agreement holder, the SBI, 
CPH that you want to include in the application, recognising that some people have got multiple holdings. Um, and we said here, full list of your OS map sheet reference you wish to include in your application. Uh, in an ideal world, you would have that information to hand. But basically, we just need to understand, and ideally be an easy reference, what parts of your farm or parts of land you want to put into an application so we can generate the maps. Now, uh, learning the lessons from last year, and we'll come back to some of this in due course, um, the, although the application window shuts on the 30th of September, we're putting in a deadline for requesting application packs to the 31st of August this year. This is because for many applications, there will need to be supporting evidence, some of which, or a lot of which, what, what take some time to um, develop. And again, from last year, we had quite a few people applying for application packs you know, a week or so before the deadline who had very little chance or any chance of getting a, a complete application in because they just wouldn't be able to get the supporting evidence. So in order to provide Natural England with time to develop the maps and ensure that people have enough time to get the supporting in information they need to develop an application, Deadline for application requests, so for a deadline for asking for an application back, 31st of August this year. We do need to update the timeline that's been published with this information, and that will happen uh, over the next couple of weeks. But worth noting now, um, still a good few months to get those requests in, so uh, application pack deadline is 31st of August. Um, again, uh, one of the key lessons uh, that we learned from last year um, and it's sort of a, a development that we uh, didn't really have with, uh, with environmental stewardship. Is all land that's entering into a sea countryside stewardship agreement, including farmyards, must be registered on the RLR. Uh, so particularly for some of the, the water capital works that Philip talked about earlier, um, that land needs to be registered on the RLR. And in order to register land on the RLR, uh, an RLE1 needs to be submitted to the RPA. Um, Again, learning lessons from last year, really actively encourage people to get though any land that they want to get into agreement and the supporting RLE one submitted into the RPA as soon as possible. Um, uh, I was hopeful we were going to get a, a deadline that we could share with you today as to when those uh, CS related RLE ones need to be submitted in um, to support an application. I don't have that date yet. Hopefully, we'll have that um, agreed in the next couple of weeks. But uh, the, the headline at this stage for you as agents, if there's applications uh, that need to be put in, there's new land that needs to be registered on the RLE, um, RLR, get those RLE ones in ASAP. Um, the heifer, um, again, uh, an improvement or change from last year. All mid-tier applications will be sent to HEFA uh, consultation report, highlighting any historic environment interests and, um, and recommending options. Um, again, this was done on a voluntary basis, but basically this time all um, mid-tier agreements where, they, where we know that there's a, a historic environment uh, features on that land will be sent to HEFA. Uh, consent may be needed for some of the activities on scheduled monuments, e.g. taking soil samples. That process uh, uh, can take some time, so again, it's worth getting, getting that, um, uh, initiating that much sooner rather than later. Um, with triple SIs, any application which we're, is requested but we know contains a triple SI that will require consent, Natural England will effectively sort that out. So if you request an application pack, if we know from the land that there's a triple SI on it, uh, we'll initiate that process sort of behind the scenes to initiate the consent. Uh, we can't guarantee that consent will be granted. That obviously depends on the, the nature of the option and the, um, uh, the agreement that's being, or application that's being put forward. Uh, just a bit more on schedule monitoring and triple SIs. Um, applicants must include any land parcel on the holding that contains triple SI land or land within schedule monitoring unless it's already under an existing agreement. Um, this means a farm, a fur, farm environment record must be completed across all these land parcels as part of the application process. Uh, this will become the agreement land, whether or not CS optional items are applied to them, and will be subject to general management conditions of the scheme. Uh, 
in most cases we seek active management. So if it's got a triple SI schedule monument, we're looking for the appropriate options, items to be in place unless the features are already in a favourable condition or covered by another agreement or um, scheme offers no suitable management options. Um, the manual is clear that applications do not meet the criteria above will be rejected. Um, the point I should have made earlier, the CS mid-tier manual is available, it's available as a PDF, and there's a lot more information now. Um, so for everyone who's interested in applying, particularly agents, uh, really encourage you to spend some time to digest the manual and all the details therein. We'll pause for some, uh, take some questions in a moment, just do one or two more slides. So in terms of the application process, you need to be registered on rural payments. You need to request an application pack. Uh, there'll be, there's that, as I say, best done over the phone, you need to identify the land, there's how-to guidance within that application pack. Um, we'd also strongly encourage anyone who's thinking about applying for countryside stewardship this year to seek advice. Um, as we've already touched on, we're running a series of local events uh, similar to last year across the country. Everyone who's got, had an expiring ELS agreement for this year, or indeed had an expiring agreement last year but didn't apply, has been invited to one of the, I think it's 60 or 70 plus local events that we're running in across the country. Details of local events are on the CS pages on .gov. Um, so if you're thinking of applying, really actually encourage anyone to uh, attend an event. We're also running clinics for those people who've already requested an application pack. Um, have started to do some thinking and do about what options might be appropriate. The clinics will be run, they're on a case by case basis. Um, uh, uh, but for those people who are developing an application, strongly encourage the clinic. As Philip mentioned, for those people in high quality or high quality target areas, particularly with the risky options, strongly recommend speaking to a, a CSFO uh, about that and getting some endorsement. And I think as we touched on earlier, there will be applicants who are thinking about going into mid-tier agreement this year who will be part of the facilitation fund. Um, uh, and those where they are part of the facilitation fund, the facilitators might also be able to provide some support in terms of developing an agreement. So there's a range of support out there. Again, equally, you know, aware that there's a range of um, you know, yourselves, land agents out there who can also provide support and advice to customers in terms of developing the application. But for those people, or customers who are just thinking of doing it directly themselves, there's a range of support available. <coughs> I'll just um, cover this slide and then we'll pause with some questions. Um, complete submit the application. Um, so the application form, uh, so your application pack application form, a fur blank map, options map to put your options on, environmental information map, how to guidance, um, terms and condition, and any info that we have from the previous ES agreement. Uh, so there's, a, there's a, a bundle of information there that will help you develop an agreement. Uh, as I mentioned previously, you do need to leave time to collect any supporting evidence, be it schedule monument consents organic certification, um, triple SI consents, whatever, as these will be needed to support an application. And that supporting evidence needs to be submitted with the application on the 30th of September. Um, so, you know, we need to get, in terms of applications, you need to get all that supporting evidence up front. Please don't leave it to the last minute because some of this stuff takes a good few weeks, indeed, you know, four or five weeks to, um, to get. Um, Um, and then before submitting the application, you know, read the manual. Uh, I can't stress this enough, you know, particularly environmental stewardship. We had lots of people who signed the paperwork and didn't really read the manual, weren't aware of what they were agreeing to or signing up to. Really important that people read the manual up front. Uh, you know, to consider the statement of priorities um, or the magic maps um, or the online option tool to understand what the local priorities are. We've got a range of capital items um, and options to choose from. The op online option selection tool identifies the high priority ones, but there's others that are available online. Um, for those people who adopt the wild pollinator farm wildlife package, you do get an uplift in terms of your score. Equally, if you're addressing uh, putting um, 
uh, addressing uh, water quality issues in high priority target areas and you've got CSFO, that will give you an uplifting score. If you're working as a group to address land, um, uh, wildlife at a landscape scale and you're part of a facilitation group, that will improve your score. Applications and sporting evidence need to be submitted by the 30th September. Once we've got that application, we'll send you a receipt to acknowledge that um, it's been received. Quite a lot to take in there, so let's just pause to go for some questions, um, many of which I think have already been covered. Question from Claire, do you still need to request a heifer with this automatically when you request your application pack? Um, uh, the heifer will be done automatically, Claire, um, uh, through Natural England now. Um, Philip, permit your applications. Uh, kind of about scoring there. Uh, question, Brendan, can you advise get mid-tier dummy application form? Uh, unless I'm very much mistaken, Brendan, the uh, draft mid-tier application form is already available on the countryside stewardship pages of .gov. Um, we've hopefully made some big serious or significant improvements to those pages. If you look under the forms page or mid-tier section and then forms, I believe there is a, an example application form available online. Um, uh, worth noting that as a principle, all application forms, we do put examples online now for everyone's benefit because we know it's useful. Um, one more question, oh, long question. Um, are we talking about 2017 window for combined flood resilience with farm wild package for uplands would be the way to go? Real synergy making options hard to deliver outcomes. Um, okay, this is that was an answer. That, that, that was an answer. Okay. 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 Um, thank you. And then we've got a question from Susan about scoring and score uplift particularly. Uh, yes. Susan, the question was, are we going to be considering scoring and uplifts and reviewing how that's working? Uh, I know Martin's on the call. My understanding is we will be reviewing that end of this year once we've had a sort of, as I say, a proper run of CS applications, um, you know, recognising last year as a bit exceptional. So I think on the back of this year's applications, then we will be reviewing scoring. Um, you know, point around continuous improvement. I think James made earlier about, you know, as much as we want the scheme to be steady, we need to recognise that based on evidence, feedback, what have you, that improvements will need to be made um, and that, you know, reviews will have to happen and uh, my understanding is that scoring will be, review scoring have, will take place at the end of this year. Moving on. Um, so, just to recap, so mid-tier application, submit the application. Those applications which need to be submitted with us to Natural England by the 30th September with supporting evidence. Um, they will then be reviewed, so we'll, we'll see them, we'll review them. Any issues will be discussed with applicants, so if there's any kind of gaps or any other particular issues, um, we'll, we will discuss that with the applicant. Um, for some people, we know that they might need to have a draft agreement um, to, to discuss it uh, um, or kind of review with partners, so tenants and landlords, a case in point, in which case we will produce them a, a draft agreement so they can have those conversations. Applications will then be um, checked for eligibility in school, so we need to check that, you know, what say is there, uh, is there, um, and once all those kind of checks uh, have been done, the application will then be scored. Um, Applicants will then be told whether they've been successful or not in mid-November. So end of September, applications will be received. We'll do this kind of checks eligibility. Mid-November, people will be told whether they've got an application or not. Um, and unsuccessful applications will be told why their application has been rejected. So that might be they have provided the relevant evidence, they don't have the right consent, or, um, you know, in some instances, and I suspect it will be kind of more exceptional, that you know, they just haven't addressed the local priorities or the application is not good enough quality. Um, so as I say, applicants need to be, applications supporting evidence need to be with the 30th of September. Offers there must be, so once someone's been offered an agreement, they will have 20 days to accept that offer or it will automatically be withdrawn. 
So mid-November, you'll have 20 days to accept the offer of an agreement if you've been successful. Otherwise, it will automatically be withdrawn. Those that kind of uh, 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 that are accepted, agreements that are accepted, will then commence on the 1st of January. Um, applicants will be informed that their land um, uh, agreement has started. And if there's any triple SI land, that's when the formal consent will be included as part of the letter. Um, I know some of these deadlines seem a bit fixed and shift from where we were with environmental stewardship, but the fact that we now have a single annual start date of 1st of January means that we have some hard deadlines internally to actually process these agreements. So um, hence, the day that we're, hence the fact we've got a 20-day exceptions um, deadline. Um, just a quick word on scoring. Um, um, and I purposely haven't got into detailed algorithms, et cetera, because I think we ended up going in a few rabbit holes last year. Um, scoring, in, in a sense, is a, it's not an academic concept, but it's only really relevant when an agreement is compared to another agreement. Scoring only uh, allows us to rank agreements. There are all agreements that come in, subject to um, budget availability. Agreements will then be kind of ranked accordingly. Um, so good agreements that address local priorities, uh, right options, right place, right scale, will score well and uh, no doubt um, compare favorably to other agreements that have gone in. Those agreements that have the incorrect options in the wrong place at the wrong scale, that don't meet the local um, environmental priorities or only address one particular issue, will score badly uh, and they have a greater chance of um, being rejected. But uh, in terms of what is the absolute score, there isn't an sc absolute score. It very much depends on how the agreements compare with each other. So picking the right options to tackle target areas in your priority will ensure you score, uh, score well. Focus on quality, not quantity. Selecting options that do not address priorities will weaken your application. Uh, options that deliver multiple objectives, such as for water biodiversity, will score more highly. Um, now, and I, I'm going to be frank here, I'm sure, and I know having conversations with some people out there who are much more close to the detail, is, yeah, if someone really wants to work around the scoring process, uh, they probably can. Um, as I say, it's, uh, it's just a means of ranking agreements on top of each other, so those agreements that deliver the most the local environmental priority and um, offer the greatest return on investment in terms of taxpayers' money will score highly. Uh, those agreements that don't deliver very much for the local environment are, are more likely to be rejected. Um, sorry, pressing the wrong buttons here, new system. Um, quick trot through capital items over here because we haven't got a lot of time. Uh, many of these are already open, uh, so hopefully you'll already be familiar because we've done webinars in the past. Information is available on the website. Hedgerows and Boundaries Quick Capital Grant Scheme that opened 1st of February this year. Um, grants up to 5K over two years. Again, very simple hands-off scheme. Uh, open 1st of February, close 30th April this year. If you apply for a Hedgerows and Boundary Grant, um, and you're successful, you can still apply for mid-tier, you just can't include the same capital items for obvious reasons. We've got Woodland Creation Grants for Tree Planting, um, again that's uh, closed the, the last Friday I believe it was. Um, and then we've got some plan-based grants. These are very much, these are open all year, but are very much by invitation only. So there's woodland management plans um, being managed by the Forestry Commission, and there's feasibility studies, implementation plans. This is very much focused for higher tier agreements, um, have a limited scope, uh, a number of applications. Um, so uh, those are also available. Uh, the facilitation fund, we've had our second round. Uh, Year one was very successful, year two by all accounts is even more successful. We're just reviewing those applications um, and there'll be more than further information um, around that probably in a few weeks' time. Um, if you want to see some case studies, you go to the facilitation fund uh, on uh, pages on countryside stewardship and there's some really interesting case studies about what's achieved from last year. We'll do the same for this year, and the expectation is the third round of facilitation fund will open early next year with a similar time frame. Um, what have we got next? So covering where we've got to in terms of facilitation fund, uh, hedgerows and boundaries, again, information's already available, so I'm not going to repeat what we've got on the slide there. 
uh, woodland creation. Again, we've covered that. Uh, been a lot of webinars in terms of woodland creation and local events with forestry um, done by the Forestry Commission colleagues. Um, useful table. I know there's been a number of requests for this. This is in the guidance, I believe. Uh, capital grants compatibility. So what can go with what? So if you've got an ES agreement, 2015 water capital grant, yes. If you've got an ES agreement, 2016 onwards standalone water capital grant, yes. And Philip have already covered that. Can't be on the same piece of land. Yes, agreement 2016 mid-tier multi-year annual agreements. No, can't have those. Emerald Woodland Grant Scheme. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I get a bit confused when it comes to wood and stuff. Uh, uh, onwards mid-tier multi-year annual agreement. Yes, it's related to different parcels on your land. Um, and well, the others are relatively straightforward. We've already touched on hedgerows and boundaries. Um, a standalone water capital grant, as I've said, yes, if it relates to different parcels of land. Uh, so just a kind of quick recap, because um, I'm keen to leave five minutes or so for some questions at the end. Um, if you're interested in applying for countryside stewardship, you need to check the priorities on that particular area of land. What are the local priorities? It's a competitive process, so not all applicants will be successful, but if you do, the right type of um, the right options at the right scale to meet local priorities, a very good chance of uh, securing an agreement. If in any doubt, keep the agreement focused on fields that will deliver the options and not the whole farm. And remember closing dates, so don't leave until the last minute. As I said, the deadline for applications, requesting an application back to the 31st of August. There is supporting evidence uh, that will be required, uh, some of which might take some time. So you know, it's worth thinking about doing an application this year, starting early and doing that initial work. Um, and I suspect um, further information, as I mentioned a number of occasions, uh, .gov.uk countryside stewardship, all the guidance up there and links to all the uh, uh, supporting tools is available from countryside um, um, those pages. If you want an application pack, call Natural England on the number listed, 0300 0603 um, As I say, the event details of the local the, the events, again, on the Countryside Stewardship pages, um, and uh, as are the contact details for the one-to-one -one clinics, but the, those clinics are mostly booked through people who've attended the events. And the deadline for submitting applications for mid-tier applications is the 31st, 30th of September. So I think that might be my last slide. It is. Um, we've got about seven minutes, according to my clock, for questions. Let's um, see what's come in. Uh, question from Isabel for the mid-tier farm uh, examples. Yeah, the onus will be for, because we want to make sure that we've got adding a local flavour at the event so people can understand what the local priorities are. The onus will be on the uh, people who are running those events and we're doing that through FAF uh, to develop some of those local case studies or examples themselves. Um, many of these have been answered. Um, We've got a question coming from Anne. Um, okay, and we can respond to your query about hedgerows and boundaries. I think the person uh, dropped me an email in the first instance, and um, uh, the person probably best speaks to would be Martin, but uh, send those through to me. Have we got any other questions coming in from anybody? No, Alex. Speak now, forever hold your peace. <laughs> Sorry, Rebecca. So we haven't had any that we haven't answered on chat, actually, but I'll just give it a few more minutes to see if anyone's typing away. Okay. okay, well, we'll give everyone another minute or 30 seconds to submit any questions. Just to repeat, um, we have, we'll be recording this webinar and uh, technology permitting, we'll be posting this on the CS page of .gov, Page of .gov. Uh, there is the wild pollinator um, webinar that 
James mentioned earlier. Again, we will circulate that and um, host that on cs.gov. Again, very interesting, very useful uh, session around that to help um, uh, increase people's understanding. We're running a similar webinar, if not exactly the same webinar, for other land agents uh, on Thursday, I think the same time, 12.30 till 2. Um, the events, as I say, all those details are on the website. Uh, they'll be running over the course of the next um, couple of months. I think we're doing somewhere between 60 and 70. Um, really keen that we encourage people to submit CS applications this year. Hopefully the improvements that have been made, both the time to the guidance, the options, and uh, the, the timeline will um, uh, make, make it much easier for people to apply than last year. Um, and with that, let's see if we've got any questions. Uh, Caroline, can we restore hedge or boundary grant and then protect with fence for mid-year? Uh, Caroline, I'm afraid I can't answer that question. Uh, I suspect it's covered in the um, hedgerows and boundary guidance. If not, um, submit a query through to the inquiries uh, line at Natural England, and we should be able to respond to that. Uh, in fullness of time, or well, sooner rather than later because the deadline shuts. But uh, without further ado, I'd like to thank everyone who's attended today. Big thanks to Rebecca, James, and Philippa for contributing. Um, we'll make these recordings available to all. I hope you found it useful. Um, but on that note, and slightly ahead of time, I'll call the call to a close. Many thanks, everybody. Have a good day.